Over the years, there have been a couple projects that have really stuck with me, and one of them has absolutely been creating Victorian lampshades. And since I happen to be redoing my bedroom, I thought I really had no choice but to revisit this project yet again. Now to start making your own lampshades, you're gonna have to start off with the frame. I ordered my previous ones and these from Mary Maxwell. There's so many choices with really unique and beautiful designs of frames. They are a little bit on the pricier side, so there are always are options on eBay or out thrifting. You can find an old lampshade that needs to be redone, or sometimes you can find just the frames that are just from old lampshades, and that's a much more frugal way to go about it. Now the first thing we're going to do is cover everything with seam binding and this serves as an anchor for you to be able to sew all of your fabric and details onto later. Once our lampshade is entirely covered, we have to take our measurements so we know exactly how much fabric we will need to cut for each of the sections. Now I have four main sections per lampshade and four smaller sections. So I am taking the measurement of the length and the width and I'm adding about an inch roughly. So I have about a half inch seam allowance all the way around. I always like to lean a little bit more conservative with these numbers just in case. So I make sure that I have plenty of fabric. Now, unlike my last lampshades, I am going to be custom dyeing this fabric because I wanted to have full control. I had the color very perfectly in my mind. I wanted to challenge myself to not do a red lampshade because that is what I did the last time and I want to use a lot of red in my bedroom. And as much as I love monochromatic, I think it's really important to have different layers to add more dimension and visual interest. And I wanted to opt for a more orange coppery shade. Along with dyeing my own fabric, I'm also gonna be dyeing my own fringe. So I ordered quite a few yards of this. I made sure to measure exactly half, so I have enough for each lampshade. A really good way to make sure that you have a very even dye job is to roll up and secure with little pins. That way you can dunk the whole thing into a pot of water and you don't have to deal with this whole mess of loose fringe everywhere. Now I have dyed quite a few times and I've made my very big share of mistakes and I do run into a conundrum, but we'll get to that a little bit later. The first set I'm gonna be dyeing is going to be the base fabric. Before you dye anything, you wanna make sure that you soak everything in water. This allows for better and even distribution of the dye. And then I simply just read the instructions and follow them exactly. Depending on the type of fabric that you are dyeing, you want to make sure if it's synthetic, you're going to need completely different dyes. If it's 100% polyester, I found that that is very challenging to dye, especially if you want to be making a very big color difference from its original state. A lot of times they tell you they want you to add salt or vinegar to so read the bottle, make sure that you know what kind of content your fabric is made out of. And I am custom mixing a blend here, and this is a lot of testing. I made sure to cut quite a few strips of extra fabric so that I have plenty to make different swatches of. My first swatch, as you can see, was very bright orange, not exactly what I wanted at all. So it was a lot of back and forth until I got the perfect color. And once I got that perfect color, I was able to start working on my fringe. I wanted to do a slight ombre, so I wanted to start off by make sure that that bottom has more exposure to the bath than the top. I also thought it would be really cool to do a nice little black edging just at the very, very like last inch of the fringe. So after I had finished doing all my dyeing, I made a bath of just black dye and submerged it. Now, contrary to my other lampshades, I'm gonna be actually using a lining that's just an off-white fabric for the backing. I did this for a couple reasons. One of them being is that when you are testing out your fabrics, you wanna make sure that you're putting it up against the light because there are some fabrics that for some reason, I'm not exactly sure why, again, I am still in the process of being a student in the whole world of vintage lampshade making. But some fabric has almost um, like a pattern that shines through when you light it. And I don't like that look. I don't think it looks very good. And 
in my experimentation after I had already bought this fabric uh, sight unseen I had to buy it online because I didn't have many options close by to me in person and I saw that if I were to put a backing towards it, it heavily reduced that weird texture that was rising with the light and that kind of helped neutralize everything. You want to make sure that everything is pulled very taut, that you are making sure that there are no diagonals or crimps in the fabric and you're securing everything in place. My last lampshades, I definitely could have done it a lot tighter and you want it like, like drum tight. That way there's no wrinkles or puckers because again, when the light is shining through, all of your little imperfections and mistakes will be illuminated. And so it's best to take your time and be patient. I found this beautiful lace fabric and I wanted to overlay it on the smaller sections of the lampshades. Now I had quite a bit of an issue with dyeing this next fabric. So this is the chiffon that I decided I wanted to make a rosette with. I made a rosette and explained the process in my last video. It adds such a beautiful detailing and the thing was that I had bought this fabric at one of my favorite stores and it was on a bolt that said it was 100% cotton. Now I could tell that it definitely wasn't 100% polyester. I'm still not an expert. I can't just look at a fabric and tell you, oh, I know 100% the percentage of content of stuff. And depending on dyes, sometimes if it's a very, very low percentage of synthetic, it's gonna be okay. Again, depends on how dark you want things to be. Regardless, I dyed it with my regular dyes. It really did not take at all. And I did a little burn test, which is where you literally light your fabric aflame. And if it kind of disintegrates entirely, it's most likely a natural fabric. If it starts to curl in on itself and then get hard and kind of respond the way plastic does, unfortunately, then you know you don't have a fully natural fabric and that is what was revealed to me so I had to go and find some synthetic dyes and then try my best with the dyes because with weird dye they're completely different shades they're not the same in synthetic and natural dyes if that makes sense so I had to try to custom fit the exact color of my other fabric which was a little bit of a trial and error test I tried to wet a little swatch I had on hand still of the original fabric so I can kind of can see what to wet what might fit and then I also made sure to fully dry this chiffon fabric before I made any conclusive decisions because when it is wet it is significantly darker than dry and again I just want to make sure that it was as perfect as possible. Now for the rosette all you have to do is measure a very straight line towards the top and weave your needle in and out, pull it all together. I like to tuck in the ends so that the fringiness of the raw edges of the fabric don't shine through very easily. Now, just as a very simple guide for creating my rosette, I am folding my fabric in half, placing a pin, and then doing that process again so that I have four anchor points that give me an idea, an estimate, for how much fabric to use in each quadrant so that the ruching is as even as possible. This fabric also had a very slight stretch to it and I think that made actually doing this ruching pleating process a lot easier. One thing to note whether it is stretched or not is that you want to slightly tug to create these natural folds but you do not want to be too harsh. I always have a tendency to be a lot harsher with things than I ever intend to be and I did have one of my rosettes explode. So you wanna make sure that you're gentle when you're tugging and then also that you're securing rosette really, really well when you're just creating it initially so that it's pretty strong with the little bit of tugging that you do apply to it later. 
I always overuse pins in this section just so I make sure that all of the pleats are really in perfect shape. And then again, go in with a whip stitch very simply around the edge, securing everything. Now, because these frames are much smaller, I think it's even more important to make sure that when you are trimming your fabric, it is really, really flush up against the stitches. Of course, you don't want to clip your stitch, but I'm going to be using a smaller and thinner gimp just to make it look a little bit more proportionate, and I want to make sure that none of the fabric is peeking through. The very last thing I'm doing here is just trimming my rosettes to make sure that they are pretty even, more compact, that makes them look a little bit just more full, and it removes all the wispiness and little ravelings that might have happened in the process of you creating it. And now it's time to start embellishing our lampshade. As I said, I found this really beautiful gimp that is a different design like, than the very traditional one that I kind of used the last time, and it is, I believe, slightly thinner. I could be totally making this up, but I felt like it was thinner, and I thought that proportionately it looked very delicate and beautiful along with my lampshade. Because this frame is smaller, corners are definitely a tiny bit trickier, but because I'd already done this one time before, I felt like this whole process was a lot simpler. It just is a matter of taking your time. For glue, I use Fabri-Tac. I like it because I am able to have a little bit of movement time. As I put things in place, it's not gonna dry super quickly, but it's also not gonna take forever to dry that things are literally falling off. It's also a little tacky, so while I'm waiting to use clips to secure everything, it's gonna hold itself up to some degree. Now I found this really beautiful trim with these beautiful beads and little tassels that I thought would complement so nicely. And again, going really slow around the edges and almost folding the trim is the key. And I also found that in these little edges, these little top corners, the best thing to do is to actually use little pins to secure everything. And I actually went section by section. As you see here, I'm putting in the pins so that it dries really well and leaving the rest of the trim draped upwards so it's not pulling down on it. And I actually let it dry for a couple minutes before proceeding to the next section. That way I'm not accidentally having the trim fall as I bring the trim downwards, if that makes sense. You do want to make sure that you remove these pins at, you know, before it's 100% dry because it would be a shame that you glue pins accidentally to your lampshade. So you want to make sure that doesn't happen. And our very last step is to give our lampshade a little trim. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to give it a like. And don't forget to hit subscribe so I can catch you in my next video. And I will see you then. Bye.